Calling Christopher Anderson in London. Oh, calling London, calling London. Yes. So, so welcome to History Happy Hour. And um, uh, we are going today to talk about uh, your five favorite history books, uh, five, uh, five history books you would take to a desert island. Yes. And so, but first of all, Chris, do you have a cocktail? It is I happy hour. Cocktail. Okay. What are you drinking oh, this week? I uh, again, another uh, a twelve-year-old uh, grandmother. Okay, nice. nice. I have I have a two-hearted ale. Ooh, branching out. No laughing. Sh should be a uh, a Doctor Who drink, but I don't think it is. Two-hearted ale. And I've already opened it, so I can't spill it on myself this week. <laughs> so really excited about that. Um, and we are, uh, uh, so so. let me ask you, before we get into our topic of history books you would take to a desert island, and we have a bunch of people who've given us their thoughts, and we, we encourage people to add other thoughts in the comments as we go along. What to, what are you reading now? Are you reading uh, anything in the midst of quarantine right now that we'd be That's all I am doing right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm reading um, Richard Holmes' History of Churchill's Bunker. Okay. Uh, that's like that's the cabinet war rooms. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. A new. I am reading uh, these truths, which oh. is a one volume history of the United States by Jill Lepore. You're getting a little. I think you're getting a little pretentious, Rick. You're just kind of showing off how thick the book is. Is that what you're yeah, trying to do? Yeah. Um, it has pictures also. Oh, so okay. It's okay. Okay. Um, I started it a long time ago, and um, I just recently picked it up again because I have time to read. So it's kind of interesting. So um, we asked people to uh, come up with their thoughts on uh, favorite history books, and uh, so we might as well just jump right in and see if we can uh, share some of those here. And so here's uh, some suggestions from uh, Joe Strauss. So hey, Joe, thank you so much for contributing. and. Hey. Um, I'll start on the bottom. Chris, uh, the book Patriots by A.J. Langeth, is a, it's not a new book. It's been out quite a while. I, I would say it's uh, from the 80s or 90s. And it is a, I love, it's a book I love because it's got a lot of great uh, stories from the American Revolution, uh, including um, the story of George Washington, uh, who was sitting in his boat um, uh, about to cross the Delaware when Henry Knox stepped in and... Uh, 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 Washington, a man who is, as far as I know, only told two jokes in his entire life, said, uh, uh, he said, uh, uh, basically, he said, you know, slowly, uh, Henry, or you'll swamp the damn boat. Uh, oh, said, yeah, shift your fat ass slowly, or you'll swamp the damn boat. And that is supposedly a direct quote, um, and, um, and supposedly was uh, something that amused the men and helped warm their spirits as they crossed the Delaware. But it's a terrific book, and I think you we you know the author of the next two books. Uh, I I may have heard that name before. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so we have Band of Brothers. That's a, a topic you know a great deal about. Well, yeah. I mean, it's uh, I don't know. It's a it's a special book for me because it obviously had a pretty major impact on my life and it's about people that I'm very close to. And um, uh, boy, it, it, it is certainly a, a case of something that, that had a profound impact on me and oh, sure. the direction I took. So yeah, it's, it, and I, but I wanna say that I deliberately didn't put that in my top five just because it would seem like too too obvious. But yeah, I'm glad Joe did. Absolutely. And uh, Undaunted uh, Courage, uh, which is the Stephen Ambrose book about Lewis and Clark, which is another uh, another tour. Well, this is Joe. Joe is like giving us the promo opportunities. There's the Band of <laughs> Brothers tour. There's the Lewis and Clark tour. And Rawhide Down. So a book that I'm not familiar with uh, about Ron right. Harkin. Do you know this book at all? No, I don't. I'm looking at the author is uh, Wilbur is uh, Del Quentin Wilbur, it looks like. So a book on Ronald Reagan. So that's uh, five history books that Joe would take to a desert island. And um, so so now we've gotten started, right? We've gotten- I'm already. Right. And um, so uh, we, uh, one of the things we're trying to do today is, oh, see, there's technical error number one. That's a problem. Um, 
We are trying to bring in some guests today to talk about their five favorite history books. And I think our first guest, uh, George Luz, is ready. Should we bring him in or should we at this point just decide not to? And, you well, know, no, yeah. I mean, I think well, most of the people who are watching the show are watching because of George. So if we want anybody to listen, we should probably bring him in. Uh, okay, so George, you are part of History Happy Hour. What hey, a George. This hey, is. what's going on, guys? And he's got his coffee mug and a great looking shirt there, George. You like this one? Yes, it, okay, cool. I, it's I, it is kind of blinding me. But, <laughs> <laughs> I could have got something a little bit more subtle, but I figured. Well, but, but see, he can't show off his socks down there, so. <laughs> George, where are you joining us from? Um, my office. This is my office, my den, my sanctuary, and uh, this is where everything I've got of any value other than Susan, which is the most valuable, this is where it's stored. I was actually thinking of a state or country, but cool. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I am coming from North Situate, Rhode Island. Say it, say it slower, George. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Rhode Island. Situate stands for running water. Rhode Island is a state full of human beings. <sighs> That's right, including me. I, and I am a former Rhode Islander. I was born in Rhode Island. George, I'm getting a, I'm getting a lot of requests on the uh, comments section. They want to see your socks. Well, actually, I, I can't get my I, – I, I was going to put them on, so, but here they are. <laughs> All right. Oh! <laughs> He's very flexible. I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't get – so I just figured it would be easier. To, I have one on and one off. You know, now, George, now we, should, you. we should, for the people here who don't know who George is, we should say that uh, among many other claims to fame, I am sure that uh, George is the son of uh, George Luz, who was in the Band of Brothers. Uh, and he has also been on many a uh, Stephen Ambrose tour um, with you, Chris, uh, yeah. uh, doing a lot of those trips. So he is uh, a guy who's been on that, uh, that a lot. And we met, I think, last last June, right? June, last June, June sixth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we've talked on the phone several times. A million times, yeah. It's met at five a.m. there in the bus parking lot on the on the way to the <laughs> yeah. Normandy yeah. Cemetery. What a day! So, George, tell us about we 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 have um, your books here, your uh, five favorite books, and I'm going to, your five Desert Island books, and I brought them up, and I think I can fill the screen with them, so tell us what we've got here. Well, I'll, you know, I'll start off with Pegasus Bridge now. You know, that was my very first tour with Chris, and uh, it was a, a very long day, and we arrive at Pegasus Bridge in the, in the darkness, and um, I was so fascinated and inspired by Chris's talk uh, that when I got home, I looked up uh, my father's book, uh, Pegasus Bridge, signed by Stephen Ambrose, and read it. And, you know, a lot of folks know that I don't read that much, but, you know, Chris told such a great story that I needed to get the complete story. So every time we go back, I learn even that much more. So okay. kind of an homage Fantastic. to Stephen and Chris. All right. And then what... What's next up on the list? Well, the next one on the list is actually, this one is right in my uh, uh, reading grade level. This one is how <laughs> Easy Company became a band of brothers. Um, it's written by Chris Langlois, who's uh, Eugene Rose, Doc Rose's grandson, illustrated by Annika Hellman, uh, using illustrations, and they retell the stories of the band of brothers from 8 to 80. Okay. Um, it's very compact. It's got a lot of details, um, and uh, it's a book. Actually, I've learned a lot of the miscellaneous things that I didn't know or that I wasn't paying attention to. You're not supposed to touch okay. your mouth with your fingers if you're. Uh, uh, I, I if I if I had the ability to point at each one, I think uh, we would be we would be happy to do that. But we can uh, we at least go back so that we can uh, we can see you there, George, describing them. And so you have to hide the sheet of papers now. <laughs> George has a script. I, I wanted to be prepared. You and I are. <laughs> I wanted to be prepared. Um, but anyway, so my next book is really another interesting book. It's D Day Plus 60 Years, uh, written by a friend of mine, uh, Jerry McLaughlin. And Jerry, the journey for Jerry was uh, to discover what happened to his uncle 
Lieutenant Sullivan, who was killed on the morning of D-Day uh, while flying as a navigator with the 77th Troop uh, Carrier Squadron. And uh, he was flying in a C-47, and they were dropping 101st Airborne guys into Normandy. So uh, the, the book is just full of twists and turns. It's an incredible, incredible story. Um, and, you know, in reading that book about the Air Force, I really didn't never really thought about what the Air Force was, you know, naturally you knew what they were doing, they had a lot of casualties, but there was one part of the book where it talked about when the crews would come back at the end of each mission, and then they would go back to the barracks, and then in the barracks there would be bunks that um, guys didn't make it. Mm. Um, so anyway, it was, uh, you know, it was a, the stock reality of, you know, what every soldier deals with when, they, when a, a guy who maybe she had a bunk just right over there, didn't come back, and, you know, you kind of knew he was lost at some point or killed or something blew up, something didn't go well. But it's a it's a great, great story, and uh, and uh, Jerry wrote a, 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 an incredible book on that. So I enjoyed that one, and I read that one all the way through. Woo! So, you know, and you know me, Chris. I got to um, say, George. <laughs> And then, uh, and then my wife's book, The Nightingale of Mosul. Um, uh, and uh, my wife is actually the author, and Marcus Brotherton is the writer. Uh, Marcus has written some terrific books. He's written one on uh, Buck Compton and Shifty Powers. and uh, uh, Other guys who were in the Band of Brothers, right? That? Other guys who were in the Band of Brothers. Correct, correct. Yeah. And actually, I made my literary debut in um in one of his books called we who are live and remain you know most people don't know i've i'm, I'm a literary guy too so. <laughs> but uh i know it i know it i can do it all i can do it all so but um but in susan's case you know uh, right out of college she wanted to join the uh, the army because vietnam was still going on at the time and her dad was a purple hot um silver star recipient and he said no, she couldn't join. So uh, she joined the Peace Corps, Project Hope, uh, inner city schools. And at 33, she joined the United States Army Reserve. Um, and uh, during the reserve, she had numerous humanitarian missions in North, uh, in South America, Central America, several missions in Europe. Um, and then her unit, uh, the 399th Combat Support Hospital, um, was deployed to Iraq, Operation Iraqi Freedom in 06, 07. Wow. So uh, it's a great book, inspiring story. And Babe Efron summed it up, and he says, um, I cried at times and laughed like hell. Everyone should read this book. And, uh, you know, Susan is the superstar of the family. And, well, uh, I, well, as thank people, goodness you have one. Thank, <laughs> thankfully, you know, we all, all three of us are blessed. Now, uh, yeah, I, I mean it's it's easy to see that the that the last book there is Band of Brothers, which of course is the book about uh, uh, your dad and his uh, colleagues that Stephen Ambrose wrote. And so, and we are, um, you know, it's amazing, George. We're running out of time. You know, it, it's it's been great, but uh, but I will. But I want to ask you one question that I'm sure that anybody uh, who meets you for the first time asks you, which is. With the TV series, how right or wrong did they get your dad? Well, I, tell you, I think there was, uh, Rick Gomez did a fantastic job. Um, you know, there was like, several books out, you know, relating to my dad and, you know, how fun he was and uh, the, the kind of person he was. So I think uh, they did a terrific job as far as that goes. We'll always thank Rick for the, you know, spending the extra time. He talked to my mom a little bit, my sister and myself and try to gather as much information. And then the writers did a great job of uh, putting it all together. So we'll, we're always uh, totally thrilled at uh, Rick's performance and uh, everybody will always remember George as the funny guy. So uh, we're blessed. Yep, so well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, one of the interesting stories was, and Chris was there actually in 2002, I think it was in Phoenix, when Michael Sobel came to the reunion. Yep, I remember that. And uh, yeah, I remember that, Chris. And, oh, yeah. 
So anyway, that was interesting, and uh, I had a brief conversation with him, and I said, I can't believe your father never found out who it was that told <laughs> told him to cut the fences. I figured he'd, you know, climb over heaven and earth to find out who that was that made him right. look. So, but uh, but anyway, yeah, so, yeah, so we're totally blessed. Uh, you know, I've enjoyed the ride since uh, I was nine years old to be, connected with these guys and then blessed to connect with Chris and have him take me along on these tours. And, uh, it's been great fun and hopefully sometime soon we'll be doing it again. I hope so. George. Yeah. George, yeah. I, 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 you know, I won't eat, I won't eat Jolly Ranchers now until we're together again. I don't feel right. Okay. <laughs> uh, at least got them. Hopefully, George, now, hopefully I don't eat those all before the next tour <laughs> you know? or dinner. <laughs> or dinner, yes, 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 dinner. So. All right. George, thank you so much for joining us, and we really appreciate your being with us today. So cheers. Talk cheers, to you George. soon. Hey, uh, thank you both. Looking forward to the rest of the show. And, oh, one last thing is um, I'm looking forward to Paul's book. Paul's got a wonderful book also, so I'm looking forward to hearing him talk about that one, I'm, I'm sure. All, All right, right, George. And he'll be joining us a little bit later on. So, George, thank right. you so much. And uh, really uh excellent there and um i am i am like trying to do nine things at once here chris so who you're knows doing well. it's gonna, if it's gonna out. happen no nope. uh, what are some of the folks that have joined us joe yeah, Belcoffey, peacocks carl helds mag thanks for listening we appreciate it uh yes excellent uh mary beth cass miguel dickens Carl Hell, did you just say all those names? Or did you I, say I, different I, names? As I could. Okay. Um, so we have another uh, 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 set of books to show before we get to Yakir Katz, who's coming hey. up shortly. Yakir, if you can hear me, you're coming up shortly. And this is from Nancy Nalance. Um, well, Chris, you walk us through some of these uh, books here, if you can see them. And let me make it full screen so it's a little easier. Yeah, well, I mean, uh Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, uh, a classic book. Um, I have a comment about Shara that I'll save for later. Um, one thing that strikes me about that book is when I was growing up, my dad had uh, floor to ceiling bookcases. Uh, and at the very top was the first edition of Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. And I remember the swastika. Uh, and I remember just being just shocked to see it up there really high where I couldn't get it. And one day he, he brought it down for me and let me flip through it. I was pretty young, but I was just really struck by it. I think that's one of the, the first history books that just struck me. Stuck with I, me. I reread that book frequently, often yeah. shaking my head as I go through it. Yeah. Um, some of her others, uh, Ernie's War, it's kind of hard to, to, to beat Ernie Pyle. I mean, he's he's the man, uh, and his, his stuff still holds up, um, and it can still move me to tears. Um, and uh, any book about Scotland is a good book. So Jacobites is a wonderful book about the Jacobite Rebellion. And I got to take Nancy to Scotland for the first time. And, and I'm glad she got to read that book and hopefully made the trip a bit better. So a few titles there I recognize. Yeah, and I uh, would add uh, uh, Ghost Soldiers by Hampton Sides is a, a book about uh, 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 a raid in the Philippines and Hampton Sides I'll talk more about later because he's on my list different book but he's on my list of, uh, of favorite authors as well even though he wrote a book about ghost something and it's not my book but and also it sold a lot better than my book <laughs> and that's obviously uh, something upsetting to me but, but he also I wrote over it now but but he also wrote a blurb for another book I did, so that made up for it. Okay. So I'm all good with Hampton Sides there. We're, we're in okay. good shape now. Uh, so, Nancy, thank you so much for your selections there. And um, <clears throat> so I think that uh, he's been waiting very patiently, but we should probably uh, introduce to everybody uh, another guest that we want to have with us today to talk a little bit about a historian that we've already talked about and maybe some other things. And that would be Yakir Katz, who is the chief head honcho of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Hey, Yakir, hey, how hey, are you everyone. doing? Very well, thank you. And Yakir is in New Orleans, right? 
Yes, they're telling us that we are the epic center, but it feels that we're doing okay so far. So, uh, and Yakir, what's That's your cocktail thing. today? What's Can you ask again? I what's don't. your cocktail today? Your oh, drink. well. Um, the hour you I stick to Scotland, you know. Hey, okay. good choice. Nice. Hey, hey. Good 14. Uh, right, no ice. You got to drink it straight. They tell you not to drink ice with it. No, no ice, no ice. Um, <laughs> well, thanks for everyone for for being with us. You know, it is a happy hour. Yes. Yeah. So, so Yakir, um, when Chris was was uh, agitating to have you come on <laughs> History Happy Hour, he said yeah. that everybody's always asking about how the company got started and what the connection is to Stephen Ambrose. So. Okay. Who better to tell us that and tell us maybe a little bit about uh, your connection with Stephen Ambrose as well? Why don't you kind of give us a sense of that? Well, I, Chris, if I'm not clear, you'll translate me because you know my accent very well. All right, I'll do my um, best. We're, we're going to okay. run it. We'll actually try to uh, put the transcript on the screen there for you. you okay. Um, <laughs> but anyway, I will start with a story that started Stephen Ambrose and then I'll jump to 1999, but I will start in 1979. Uh, Stephen Ambrose already wrote about Eisenhower and was very interested to be in Europe and see the battlefield, but he did not yet write about D-Day or World War II as a whole. He was more focused on Eisenhower at the time. And he went with a gentleman named Peter McLean and he crossed the channel at night and maybe he had a little too much to drink. And Peter was a little worried about how is he gonna have the next day. And Steve woke up with a big headache. And they started the day going to the cemetery, obviously. If, if it's one place you want us that you can, uh, you know for sure you're going to the cemetery. Now, Stephen never really heard about the cemetery much. He just knew that it was a great cemetery. And he walked in there, this, uh, Peter, and Peter told me the story, not Steve. He looked at all those graves and he got in a shock. He could not believe the number of graves. He looked at it, looked at it, and said, I have to write about those boys. And that's how he started the uh, D-Day project, you can say. And then the, the books that came after, the D-Day and the Citizen and Soldiers, it was all seeing the cemetery, seeing all of those graves, and thinking that he has to write about them. So that 1979, I came to New Orleans and met E.D. Ambrose in 1989. Stephen was writing his books and tours at the same time for a few more years. And at one point he said, Yaki, you should just take over. I, I'm older, I'm kind of retiring. Um, and we started Stephen Ambrose to more of kind of formal company. And Edie and I together, Edie is teaching, I'm buying the company. So that's a little, uh, the history in a nutshell. So I, I continue doing exactly what he was doing, and we, but we have people like Chris and like Rick, and you bring in more subjects. And so our company grows into many more subjects. You know, we're doing Scotland with Chris, we're doing Ghost Army with you, Rick. We going to Italy. We going to uh, um, Revolutionary War with you too. We doing Civil War. We we doing the, the thing grew from being World War Two thing to a, a much larger um, larger company. Did Steve um, ever say anything about what he thought about how the company had gotten so big or kept doing tours or anything? No. All I remember that Steve told me one thing: tell the truth. I guess if you tell the truth, you grow, you know. Yeah. Um, we tell the truth and, and we we try to tell the truth and we, we treat our customer right and, and I think they're coming back, you know. Well, he must have been happy that it kept going. Oh, he was very happy. He he, he kept saying, he kept doing this farm up. That's kind of his <laughs> thing, you know. I don't know if you met Steve, you remember he was always doing yeah. this and he kept looking at me and doing this, and it kept growing. You came along at one point and told me, let's do Ben of Brother. I remember. And the funny story about it, that I say, 
Steve, we're going to do Band of Brothers. He said, no. He said, it's not right. I said, why? He said, because it's just a unit. You know, um, you got to tell the whole story. You cannot tell a story of a unit. He said, but go ahead and try. And 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 obviously, it turned into uh, um, one of our, the, the most popular uh, tool. And I guess if you are going to the good historian, they tell you not just the story of the man, but trying to weave it in with the whole the story of the whole campaign, then it's actually come to a very good tool. Well, I don't think any of us really realized how popular it was going to be and how long it was going to go on and just what a big deal it was going to be. Well, you know, it's interesting because they said that once the veteran's going to disappear, the interest is disappearing, but I think it's the opposite. Yeah. Once the veterans are disappearing, the families and the friends and the interested are even more interested. Yeah. Uh, that's just the way I find it. So actually the number of people interested are growing and not diminishing. Yeah. You, you know, I think that uh, one of the things that that people have said to me going on the Ghost Army tour, you know, which also talks about the Ghost Army, but talks about it in the context of the whole war, like I'm sure the Band of Brothers tour does. But, but for them, it, it becomes more interesting when they can look at this big event this the biggest event in history world war ii but look at it through the lens of a small number of people uh it's, you know in, in a particular unit because then it becomes more personal and it's not about 25 million people are killed but it's about you know in yeah. our unit it's about victor dowd or it's about uh, uh another individual or the band of brothers it's about george luz or dick winters or something and it gives you something to hang on to it's always the same it's Anne frank is the most popular book about the holocaust because it talks about one person and then you connect and so that connection you you kind of your mind goes further you know so, so here you can help me out here because I get this question a lot. First, first thing okay. is the official pronunciation of your name and a little Yakir. bit. Of, oh. I, I'm gonna say it without thinking. Okay, Yakir. Okay. I just said it. You see, I didn't even look. Like I called myself. You know, <laughs> hey Yakir, come over. There you I go. Just heard it. Okay. Everybody's Was it clear. Coming. Now you know how to say it. Okay. <laughs> Now, I, uh, you want to talk to me about my books that I'm reading? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So tell us about either about what you're reading now or about your okay. five favorite history books, whatever, you, wherever you want to go with that. So first, this is my office, actually, I sit in. But the books are belonging to my wife. I'm not as such a reader as what you see behind me. So <laughs> I don't want to take credit for what I don't belong. But uh, I'm reading a great book. It's a new subject. It's the atomic bomb. So it's a Manhattan project, and it's a book that's called The Making of the Atomic Bomb, amazing book, starting, um, it starts talking about the uh, research of the atom in, 19, in the 1890s, kind of, in the late 19th century. And he does not mention it, but it's something that is very interesting in relation to today. You notice that all the scientists of the world, even during World War I, they share information like nothing else. They write papers to everybody. They all meet each other in universities and conferences. They all happily share information. And then in 1939, of course, then secrecy arrived because they deciding Germany and England and US that a bomb can't be made, and then everything turned into secrecy. The reason I'm saying it is if you think of today that we have a big world war against the virus, um, you hope and you really hope that all of our scientists, that all the scientists around the world right now are working on solutions and you really, really hope that they all share it and not compete with one another. And that's just kind of a thought that I'm having as I'm, as I'm reading that book. Um, Otherwise, the book is amazing. It gives you a lot of technical information and a great history about how that project all came about. And what was and the title of it again? What's the, title uh, the title is The Making of the Atomic Bomb. Uh, I'm going to see who wrote it, just a moment. 
Okay. So, yeah. I, it's uh, happening live, folks. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, that's, that's enough to tell that I turn off my phone, so I, I cannot see the name. Of okay, the, author. the making of the atomic bomb. You know, someone, someone out there in our, in our vast viewership is going to Google this right now, and they're going to write a comment. Right out of the fire. And uh, okay. they are going to save our butts, it, right? It's very technical. But don't let the technical stop you from reading it. If you're not so technical, pass it and keep going for the history part. You know, you don't have to 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 worry if you don't understand every technical part of the book. No. Uh, Yakir, I wanted to ask you a question, um, and and if I get it wrong, you know, just dock my pay if you need to. Uh, the vast amount. You don't of get money. paid anyway. Well, that, yeah. what is that to dock? You know. Yeah. Well, I paid every penny I'm worth. Uh, uh, you're you're a you're a paratrooper too, aren't you? I uh, yes. I think. By the way, wait, wait. the book you're curious reading was written by Richard Rhodes. Okay. Okay. Richard Rhodes. Thank you, Jennifer right. McQuillan, and thank you, yes. Ruth uh, Racefeld, who wasn't sure she could get on Facebook today, but managed to figure out how to do it. Awesome. Thank you, Ruth. All right, so back to you, <laughs> Okay. So you're a quick you're thing about. Okay, so a quick story about me, a power trooper and Stephen Ambrose. So I just met Steve. He asked me, oh, you're from Israel, so you were in a service? I said, yes. And he said, what did you do? I said, I was a power trooper. So he goes to the book shelves that he has, and he hand me uh, um, the book Pegasus Bridge. He said, here, it's about you guys, and read it. So that was the first book I read of Stephen Ambrose, was Pegasus Bridge. And he said, here, it's about Power Trooper, so you, you better read that book. Yeah, I, I jump about 19 times. Um, all of them uh, end up fine. You know, I didn't break anything, didn't get injured. It does happen you see quite you're often. you're here, right. I'm here. No, but <laughs> knees and back. You know, hide your gnarled body so we can't really it, tell. The more you jump, the more chance to get a little bit nicks and knocks, you know. But luckily, I had good jumps, you know. We have very low night jumps. They, you jump at night from a very, very a 400 feet, you know, 500 feet, and you come to the ground really, really quick. And it's kind of scary, but, but you made it. We may all made it, you know. Um, and nothing like jumping in, in a combat, you know. Mm -hmm. well, and I want to say something to George about pilots and about Ambrose uh, kind of relating everything. Oh, yeah. Um, there were a lot of young pilots that flew, uh, as we all know, that flew the, the power trooper into Normandy. And Steve wrote in his book that they didn't do too well. You know, there yeah. was a little navigation issue. There was a little fear issue, a little bit knowing how issue. And we got a, he got a lot of slack for it. Whether or not it's true what he wrote, I don't know. Better historian can tell it. But there was a little bit of a hard feeling between what he wrote about the pilots uh, that took the power trooper into Normandy and what the pilot felt. You know, it's not an easy job to be shot at and to stay steady. You know, so I'm not jealous of of those pilots. You know, no. flying in. Absolutely. Well, Steve talked to me about that when when he was still. Uh, when I was still with the magazine and he would write for us, he, we were talking about one of his articles. He said, and just don't, don't mention the, the troop carriers because I'm going to get in trouble again. I don't want to get in trouble again. I see. Now, did, what, did, did you read quite a bit of, uh, about troop carriers yourself? Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you feel that way it's about a little bit of that? Or? I'm going to take, no. take the fifth on that. Okay. <laughs> Okay. No, I, okay. I think that we can uh, tell we can tell other truths. We don't have to tell all the truths, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just the truths. I think there's an awful lot more to the story than the paratroopers remember. Uh, but I as see. I tell people on my trips, um, there were lots of reasons uh, for what happened. But at the end of the day, not too many of the paratroopers were dropped where they were supposed to be. Right. Well, we know the storm, the wind, the darkness, the the fire. I mean, the, the enemy fire, everything combination of all of it is not very good combination for, for exact, you know? No. So, well, and, 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 and it's what led them, at least in part, to do a midday drop 
in uh, Market Garden, where they did drop everybody pretty much exactly, if not Tough exactly, day. close to where they wanted to. And that didn't work out so well either. That didn't work out so <laughs> well either. Actually, it worked better than Normandy than it worked in. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it doesn't You care. We are. We thank you so much for joining us. And, All right. Uh, I thank everyone that, that joining us. I really do. I, I can't believe how wonderful our, our, our guests are. You know. So I'm what about thanking our everyone. Yeah. What about the hosts? Hosts. Well, the hosts? Our, guests, our, our guests are that good because of the hosts. Oh. <laughs> if there were no good hosts, they won't be here. You know. So this is a without saying. Oh yes, but, right. but let's say I drink it. for you, host. I enjoy yeah. your scotch, you care. Cheers! Thank you so Cheers. much, you care. We really appreciate you joining us, and uh, we are saying goodbye to you here. There, okay. So, Chris, we should probably talk about our. We have many more people, and we're going to try to get to everybody's. But we should probably talk about our own favorite books, our own five choices to take to a desert island here. And I'll so I'll I'll start with you. Okay. Um, and put your uh, selections up here. And um, uh, you, this is you, right? Did I get them correct? That's, me. That's, that is me. Okay, so tell us about these books and why these are the five that Chris Anderson would take to a desert island. Um, well, I, I will just start with, uh, with The Old Breed. Um, it is a story about um, a young Marine in the K Company, 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, 1st Marine Division. Um, and it is, to my mind, without question, the finest book uh, written by a soldier in combat, period. Any war, anything I've ever read. Um, he describes it in such a way that uh, it has an authenticity to it that I, I just find hard to beat in anything else I've ever read. Um, I've always been a huge admirer since I first read the book. Um, and one of the highlights of the Pacific trip with me is uh, we get to go uh, to where he was on Peleliu, and I get to read from that book, and it's it's very moving to me. Um, so I can't recommend that highly enough. Um, and uh, the next would be the, the First Day on the Psalm uh, by Martin Middlebrook, uh, one of those history books that really had a huge impact on me. Um, it it focuses on uh, July 1st, 1916, the, the first day of what would be uh, the bloodiest battle in British military history. But um, for me, as, as a young historian kind of coming up, it showed me how to analyze a battle uh, and to bring in not only um, the eyewitness accounts, but to use them in such a way to explain the battle in really uh, great detail, but digestible detail. Um, so it was, it was an eye opener for me on how to understand um, a battle. Um, John Keegan, uh, The Face of Battle, probably the most important history book I ever read. Um, it was the book that really introduced me to uh, the role of the individual uh, in a battlefield. Um, it was a game changer in, in uh, historiography and talking about the, the similarities in battles, how battles are analyzed and some of the, the commonalities. Um, if you want to understand some of the threads that run through military history, it's really hard to beat that book. Um, Campaigns of Napoleon, um, I read that when I was in junior high school and it just, the detail, I remember being transfixed by the maps um, the descriptions of battles uh, were very compelling, uh, and it was the first thing I read where I could say, "Boy, that's a that's an authoritative piece of work." Um, and Chandler uh, was, kind of became the godfather of military history. He was a, a lead uh, lecturer at Sandhurst, um, and I guess the compliment is is uh, Chandler was a Brit, uh, but he. Um, was received a letter from Charles de Gaulle in 1966 saying, you are the authority on Napoleon Bonaparte. Wow. So um, yeah. kind of hard to beat that. And then Berlin Diary, uh, Shire, again, um, I read that about once a year uh, because it scares the pants off me. Uh, mm -hmm. you read that book and you, you put yourself in Shire's shoes. Um, and as he's describing what's happening to 
um, Germany uh, and to Europe, where I'm living now, uh, it's just very chilling, and it, it never fails to kind of frighten me and you know cause me to rear up and suck my breath in. So yeah. it was a real hard one. But if there was a, if I could only take five. Well, I think I think that um, I mean I've read three of them. I haven't read the campaigns of Napoleon, and I uh, after I read the after I saw your selection list earlier this week, I've ordered the first day of the sum, but I uh, it hasn't arrived yet. Uh, everything's slow. Face of Battle is an amazing book, and it's it's description of the Battle of Agincourt and yeah. of kind of the the role of the archers in winning the Battle of Agincourt. But you can almost feel the wind. Uh, yep. And the fields of Agincourt in that book, and with the old breed is a um, a book I was interested in in writing a book about. Uh, I was trying to pick out one day in World War II and try to describe everything all across the globe that happened. And the day I haven't written this book someday, someday, um, with all the free time, right? I should be able to do it. It somehow isn't happening. Um, but uh, the day I had picked was the day that of uh, the uh, Peleliu, uh, uh, Peleliu invasion, and, yep. and Chesty, Chesty Puller's there, right? Uh, oh, the yeah. famous Chesty Puller, famous. <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, it was kind of a, a, a fun, a fun opportunity. So let me see if I can pull up my list here, and we'll do it real quick before we get to Paul Woodage, who's uh, standing by. Mm -hmm. um, and you should, uh, as I told you before, you should definitely feel free to harass uh, anything on this list. And Chris, Chris already did harass me because uh, there's two selections here that come from series of books. Yeah, so I, 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 thank you. Yeah, multi-volume series. So at the bottom is uh, one of Shelby Foote's three-part series, The Civil War. And I confess, I came to Shelby Foote after watching the Ken Burns series 25 years ago. And I have already gone through two entire sets of it, which is to say I wear them out with the rereading. And um, in some parts of Shelby Foote, maybe not quite so politically correct these days because he has such a great deal of respect for the Southern commanders and doesn't you know, necessarily deal with the, with the cause that, that they were fighting for. But it's just uh, for storytelling and putting you in the moment and putting you there I just loved his series. And then uh, I have my other two volume uh, series, uh, a novel here, and I know a couple of other people have picked novels as well, um, is uh, War in Remembrance from uh, Herman Wauk's series, uh, Winds of War, War in Remembrance. Um, and, you know, so I read this in probably the 70s, I would think. Um, and, um, I still look at this book, I still think that the history in Winds of War and War of Remembrance is pretty spectacular for a novel. I mean, when I read uh, recently The Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors, I mean, I said, well, I kind of know that story because it's in War and Remembrance. Right. And so he packed a lot of history there. The really hard to read title in the middle is um, the second volume of Manchester's Churchill series. It's, you don't have to read the rest of the series. I love this volume. It's the it's the book in which Churchill, you know, goes from essentially being uh, on the outs as a British politician to rising up and becoming prime minister. And some of the scenes in Parliament where he is standing alone, and then slowly, slowly, he's not standing alone, and there's much support. Um, those are really uh, amazing to me. Second to the top is uh, Armageddon uh, by Max Hastings. Um, I actually couldn't find my copy of Armageddon. I was very upset, so I had to Photoshop it. Onto <laughs> yeah, well book here. You can look at that. You know, what, that cover is really screwy. But um, uh, Armageddon is the story of uh, what happened in Europe in World War II starting – I can't remember exactly, but essentially it's the last six months of the war. Uh, I think it starts in the fall of uh, 1944. And, but what's interesting about it to me is that it's from everybody's point of view. So it's from the American point of view and the Germans and the people in the prison camps and the German civilians and the Russian soldiers. Um, and did, you read, did, you, did you read the Pacific uh he did a Pacific Companion to that. Retribution. Yes, thank you. 
That's actually the book that's here with Armageddon on the cover. <laughs> so, um, which is also really good. And um, uh, just a Max Hastings story. Max is about six foot 70. I mean, he's very tall. He's about, he's, I'm six two and he's four or five inches taller than I am. Um, and he's Sir Max Hastings, but uh, uh, yes. And uh, um, he was giving a talk and um, he was talking about having, interviewing somebody who was the um, survivor of a death camp and um, in New York and he'd finished the interview and he was trying to catch his plane. He was late and he was waiting for the car and he was starting to get very agitated about it. And this woman said, relax. She said, when you've been in a death camp, missing your plane doesn't seem like a very big deal. And he said he just turned bright red. He was so embarrassed that, and, and it was such a revelation to him in the moment. And the top book on my list is Hellhound on His Trail by Hampton Sides. And it is the story of the search for Martin Luther King's killer. Huh. Okay. And it is an amazingly researched book. Yes, right. Barbara, thank you. The Last Lion is the title of that um, uh, that Churchill book uh, in the middle. But uh, Hellhound on His Trail is amazing. And um, and so uh, it's, it's extremely well researched and you sort of follow along minute by minute. I love Hampton Sides as a writer. Uh, I think he's tremendous and um, uh, you know, he's kind of a writer along the lines of Eric Larson and uh -huh. not as well known as Eric Larson, but I mean, he's a multiple New York Times bestselling writer guy. Right. Um, and, and I think he's just uh, really, really great. So those well, are my five. I want to take issue, however, because, okay. you know, you picked two series, which on a page by page basis means you have more to read on the desert island than I do which means I should get another choice. Okay, what's your other choice? How to Build and Sail Small Boats, Canoes, Punts, and Rafts by Tony Reed. <laughs> <laughs> That's Fair what enough. I think of Desert Island. <laughs> <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Yes, I have a, I have a book uh, by Steve Thomas on the, the old Polynesian methods of navigation. So that might also be useful. <laughs> If we bring, if we end up on the same desert island, right. we can uh, put these things together and uh, and do pretty well. Or you can sail to my island, I'll sail to your island. So uh, we have another guest and he's waiting patiently. And uh, so I think we need to bring in uh, Paul Woodage who's coming to us from Normandy. And I'll say about Paul that he is a- hey, Nice uh, shirt, Paul. He is- hey. a, Paul's kind of divided in two right now. I wish I had a way of putting you in the middle. Then you could have one color for each of us. <laughs> but Paul is a, uh, a Normandy guide, uh, World War II guide in Normandy, and also has a, a great YouTube channel that's worth uh, mentioning here, which is um, uh, uh, it's WW2 TV, right, Paul? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And You've Paul, already talked about it. Paul's been making um, uh, some great videos that kind of put you in the spot of stuff going on uh, in Normandy during World War II. So, Paul, welcome to History Happy Hour. And what are you cheers. thinking? Cheers, cheers, cheers. Thanks for having me on. What have you got? What do you, what I, you I've got to Ireland. Powers. Uh, okay. Uh, and, and Barbara wants to know if that's apple juice, Chris. Oh, of course. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's believable. How are things in uh, Normandy, uh, Paul? Uh, yeah, cool. Um, I mean, we're on three weeks of lockdown now, so it's a little bit strange. Uh, but hey, we're we're doing what we can do, and you know, waiting for better times. Absolutely, absolutely. Is that facial hair, Paul? New facial hair? Yeah. Ha haven't shaved for a couple of days. Yeah, yeah. How are you? Good luck. It, it, can you just slide it up so that it <laughs> up here? <laughs> no, that's not funny, Rick. Okay, I'm sorry. So, Paul, we, we are talking about uh, five books that you would take to a desert island, or seven or eight if you're me. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and you've got some uh, books to share with us as well. So uh, do you want to tell us about some of the books that made your list? 
Absolutely. And um, can I just clarify, are we on the same desert island? We can exchange books, surely. That's that's part of the deal, yeah? Yeah. I, I think so, but we have to good, stay that's, that's six, six feet apart from each other, so we have to kind of talk them to <laughs> no, each other true. and then wipe them off with salt water. Well, my first book is a classic. It's 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 Catch-22, the novel by Joseph Heller. I, I read it every year, have done since I was 16. And as I get older, every time, every reread, I discover a new character. Someone else sort of resonates with me. I just think it's a classic. And although it's a novel, of course, Joseph Heller, you know, he was a, a bombardier in a B-25 in the Mediterranean. Most of the things you read about happened. So it's just a classic. And I just thought I read it every year. If I'm on a desert island, I have to read it on a desert island. So that's my first one. Easy. Boom. Catch three, two. Okay. And what's next? Take us up the list. Well, the next one is is an odd odd one, and it's not World War Two. And I read it. Uh, I bought a copy when I was staying with Chris in London back a couple of months ago. And it's um, the Five, and it's uh, by Halle Rubenhold, and it's about the five Jack the Ripper victims back in the nineteenth century in London. And like many people, I grew up reading all sorts of books about. The, the Jack the Ripper and the various candidates as to who it could have been. And, and they're all very interesting, but the five is about the victim. It's about giving life and giving a story, a backstory to the five women who were murdered mm -hmm. by, by Jack the Ripper. And it's just an incredible social history about London and the, uh, in the 19, uh, in the 1880s and, and before then, and it tells you about the poverty and the restrictions and the, and the sexism and the violence and, I just, it won lots of awards and I just found it an amazing read. I read it in about two or three days. One of those books you just blitz through because it was so good. And um, it, it, I tried to choose books that perhaps weren't as familiar to an American audience. And uh, if you're interested at all in social history in, uh, of, of Great Britain, I think The Five is just an absolutely cracking book. And uh, it'll, it'll give the backstory to those five women. And the, the, big, the big point of it is, is that the author believes that although they've been identified for years as hostage, only two of the five actually can be confirmed as, as sex workers. Another three were victims more of society. So it's quite quite a revolutionary book, and I just think it was really, really good. Excellent. Now I have, that's one not familiar to me at all. Uh, so that is you know, certainly something I want to put on my list. Yeah, it only came out last year, and it's uh, won lots of awards. So yeah, that's my, that's my second. Um, are you ready for my third? Oh, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. So the third is, um, is Double Cross by Ben McIntyre. Um, and Ben McIntyre wrote the book about Operation Mincemeat, and the other one about Agent Zigzag. And um, I'm a child of, the, of, of my times, and I grew up reading James Bond novels and watching James Bond films. And Double Cross, which is the true story of the five spies who the Germans had in England prior to D-Day, who were actually working with the Allies, reads like fiction, and yet it's actually true. It, it, you read it, and you can even see where Ian Fleming, who actually was involved in the real uh, spy operation, got a lot of his inspiration from, because one of the genuine spies, a uh, Peruvian casino-frequenting woman, is the basis for the, uh, the Vespa Lynn character in Casino Royale. So it, it reads like a thriller. And yet, you know, it's all true. And as a D-Day expert, of course, a D-Day fan, it gives that backstory of how important that that uh, information that was going from England to Germany via their agents, essentially convincing the Germans that there was this other army, the Patton army and, you know, uh, the Fuzag out in East England was, was going to be invading Pas de Calais. So it's just a fantastic book. And it, 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 it's one of those page a minute, read it, read it, thriller books, I recommend it heartily. Okay. Yeah, Double Cross, is, it's an amazing story, and Garbo and all the uh, um, all the, the feedback there, the Germans, and it's sort of the flip side of the Bletchley Park story, right? It's Bletchley yeah. Park is yeah. trying to make sure we have good information, and Double Cross is about making sure the enemy has very degraded or, or wrong information. <laughs> Yeah, so. just if, if 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 the Germans have no idea what's going on, then 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 D Day is likely to work, and it's part of that massive great campaign to make sure 
the DNA is kept secret, which is something that you know Chris and I who do take tours. You, you want to bring more of the pre-D-Day story in, but there's only so much you can do because you're there on the ground. But, you know, the, the spy network, the Operation 42, it's also very important. Okay, and then uh, next up, uh, 18 Platoon. Yeah, 18 Platoon. Well, Chris, uh, of course, with the old breed, uh, classic work. And I would say that 18 Platoon is, if there is such a thing as a British equivalent of with the old breed, then 18 Platoon is that book. It, it's, it's a classic that's taught at Sandhurst. It is the standard um, platoon officer experience. And what's amazing about Sidney Jarry, who was part of the Somerset Light Infantry, is he didn't take part in D-Day. He didn't even join the Somersets till uh, late June. So Hill 112 has already happened. And it takes you through July and August and the battle for mont Pinson, and then all the way through at the end of the war in 1945. And it's just... It's a bit like Band of Brothers, I think, and it's that little core group of, in fact, it's a platoon, it's about 20 guys because they're always under strength. And you get to know about the, their, their love for each other, the respect they had, and Sidney Jarry wrote it with the, with the uh, support of two of his sergeants, you know, 30 years after the war. And it's just an absolute classic. And for those watching who are Americans who perhaps that aren't as familiar with the British experience, you read your Max Hastings and your James Holland and that kind of thing. To actually read a book by someone who was there, so 18 but two. I don't know how easy it is to get in the USA, but uh, it's just absolutely classic. And, it, and it's only 150 pages. You can blitz through it in, you know, in two days. It's just so a, even George can read it. Even George. George. It's got a few pictures as well. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and last yeah. but not least. Sorry. No, last but not least, I said. Well, the last, I, saved, I saved the best to last, and I, and I say best um, because it's a book that um, it's hard to describe, really, because I know as a, as a historian it's probably biased, and I start that because Young, Brave, and Beautiful was written by Tanya Zabo, the daughter of Violette Zabo, the, the famous SOE agent who was dropped into France and eventually was captured by the Gestapo near Limoges and was, was, was killed in Ravensbrück. And her daughter wrote this book. It's very hard to get. I got a copy from Tanya herself about 10 years ago. And you know, because it's written by the daughter, it's probably somewhat biased. And there are other books on Violet Zabo. And for those who don't know, she was probably the most famous SOE agent of World War II. There was a brilliant film made starring Virginia McKenna called Carve Her Name with Pride back in 1956. But the thing about the book is it's a big one. It's sort of 400 pages is that I and I, the people I recommend it to to read afterwards, including, including Paul Clifford, who Chris knows very well, we, you just fall in love with Violette when you read it. You feel like you're being unfaithful to your, your, your partner because you just fall in love with this vibrant, amazing, and dare I say it, sexy lady who, who, who abandons her, her, her safe life in England. She's half French, half English. She's got a young child. Her husband's been killed in North Africa, and she volunteers to serve... Great Britain, and she jumps on one successful mission into France, into the Havre area, gets away with it, accomplishes it, and then takes a second mission on under a different name into Limoges. And this is just in the days before D-Day. And, you know, and then it ends up with this, these harrowing chapters about the treatment she received at Ravensbrook. And, and, and you just go from falling in love with the woman to feeling when at the end, and, and you're grieving, you're, 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 you're completely grieving for. So it's a book that means a lot to me, although it's not very well known. And if you can find a copy of it, Young, Brave and Beautiful, I really, really recommend it. It's not on Kindle. Um, I, have you read it, Chris? No, I'm going to, though. It's, uh, if, if not, I'll just lend you a copy, my copy. But it's just, yeah, the first time I read it, I knew 10 pages in, I had completely fallen head over in heels in love with Violet. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it, 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 and also, I think, to, to just paint this, uh, the, the picture of the fact that World War II was a, a war that men and women fought, and children. Right. And the Absolutely, women. yeah. And, and we tend to focus a lot on you know, the paratroopers and the rangers and all the guys that do all the exciting daring do stuff. And behind the scenes, there's incredible brave uh, women and others. And, and I'm glad that the SOE and the other agents are getting their kind of recognition over the last few years because it's an incredibly important job that, that isn't talked about enough, I don't think. So, yeah, Young, Brave and Beautiful, an absolute 
absolute amazing book. And I actually even just mention the title, I can feel my heart fluttering because I'm <laughs> really this one again. And I'm giving me a hard stare from across the room. Now. <laughs> okay, so you've got some explaining to do, and it's also late there, and we're running a little long. So, Paul, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Paul. We're going to have you back for some longer talks. Yeah, yeah. yeah sounds good. You definitely, you know, might know a thing or two. We're, we're getting that impression. Okay. So this is okay, then. All Thanks, right. Paul. Cheers. Thank you so much for, for being with us. Now, Chris, we need to uh, work our way through some of the people who've given us yeah, books that we have not oh. gotten to. So we're going to do that right now, even though it takes us a few minutes long. But we're going to try to get to them. And um, I'm just I'm just doing that thing where I'm doing three things at once here. So I'll go uh, to this one. This is uh, Catherine Hurst. And I, I should say by way of warning here that um, let's just make sure there's no books of mine here, right? Because this is my sister. So, uh, you know, I, I, I don't, you know, she's got a book with ghost in it and it still isn't ghost on it. So <laughs> what does it take, people? Um, uh, <laughs> How many more heavy hands can you drop? Blood and Thunder by Hampton Sides is about Kit Carson, and it's an amazing book. Um, uh, the Women's Diaries of the Westward Journey, Schlussel, Schlissel is not a book that I'm familiar with. Um, Ladies of the Canyons, also Ghost Ranch. And I know I'm sure that Women's Diaries and Ladies of the Canyons are both Southwest books. My sister lived in New Mexico for a long time, so um, she got very interested in goings on there. And then we talked about Eric Larson a little bit earlier. Yeah, In the Garden of Bees is a great story, amazing storytelling, and you know, kind of puts you in Berlin, uh, you know, with the Night of the Long Knives and the other uh, stuff like that that was going on. So that is is truly uh, an amazing book. And then uh, let's see. So let's move past that and go to. Um, oh, I, I think we'll we'll show this one next. Um, this is from Sam Doss, I believe. And um, uh, let's see what we can do here. Um, can you talk us through this one? Well, yeah. I mean, um, you know, back in the day, a long, long time ago, I was the editor of a. Um, Civil War journal, so it's been um, a bit of time since I've read uh, Lee's Lieutenants or Confederate Tide Rising, but both um, I remember as being very compelling. Uh, Douglas Southall Freeman, of course, was a, uh, had served during World War II, um, and even though it's it's uh, dated uh, by uh, biographies of his commanders, I still think it uh, definitely stands up well uh, over time. It, we, it's still, I think, a classic. Um, a Time for Trumpets, it's it's hard to beat that. Charles B. McDonald, uh, company commander uh, during the Ardennes, um, later on a historian for the Army. Uh, he contributed to that magisterial Green Book series, but uh, Time for Trumpets is his history of the Battle of the Bulge, and it's, it's the Bible of the Bulge. As far as I'm concerned, everything that's been written since then is a nice addition to what McDonald said. Uh, I particularly like it because on the bulge trip, we go to some of the spots where McDonald actually fought. And again, I can use uh, time for trumpets um, there and that's very moving. Uh, we've talked about Pegasus Bridge and a number of people have. Um, and also uh, the Guns of August, again, classic, hard to beat. Uh, the thing I love about Tuckman um, is she wasn't a professional historian by training. She was just very gifted uh, and she, um, in fact, I have it here. Almost on my list of books was uh, Practicing History, uh, which is another classic where she talks about well-written history. And, and uh, The Guns of August has to be a classic case of that. Yeah, it's a terrific book, World War I. And, uh, and uh, I love the, the opening paragraph of it. It said that it took her basically all day to write it. And its, it's rhythm and its poetry is amazing. Yep. And then uh, and there's a tiny part of the book that comes from her personal experience, or at least she was there as a child uh, on a ship in the Mediterranean that's uh, there as they're chasing the various warships through the Mediterranean. But just a very, very cool book. Uh, we're going to, let's see if we can keep going on here. And um, 
I hope folks don't mind that we're going along, but we want to talk about everybody's books. So, yeah, we want to get everybody in because why not? If people have to leave, uh, we're we're sad, but we'll we'll let it go. So this is a I, I would have to say this is a definite ringer here, Chris, because this is my co-author oh. with sales. <laughs> And uh, I did not uh, suggest to her the books to, to pick, but I do see that she picked uh, Rivals Unto Death, which just does happen to be a book that I wrote. Probably just coincidence, I'm assuming, uh, <laughs> but possibly, uh, uh, possibly something that uh, is more than coincidence. Um, she also picked Wolf Hall. Of course, that's the Hilary Mantel series that was made into a TV series about uh, Cromwell. Uh, not the not the Cromwell who took over the country, but the Cromwell who advised King Henry VIII until advised him to. Well, in fact, to, um, the last book in that series. I'm sorry, I can't remember the title now, but uh, it's just it out. Out, Yeah, it came out right here in London just as the quarantine was going in, uh, and everybody here was mad about it, and all the bookstores had a big displays about. You know, the end of the story of Wolf Hall and the tube was full of posters about it, and, you know. So, so we know. have a, yeah. So uh, somebody asked me today if I'd read it, and I said no, but I suspect it ends badly for Cromwell. <laughs> so it's just as I heard someone say in a television show the other day, it's just a hunch based on physics and reality. <laughs> so then we also have uh, Blue, the history of a color, and... I'm going to say I know nothing about that, but Liz is an artist. And so, um, you know, I obviously it's a book that speaks to her. Uh, uh, the Americans is a book that she illustrated. So there she really is now really getting into the total plugging category. Liz, if you're listening, uh, uh, it's OK. We, we love you anyway. And then uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci by Walter Isaacson, who, of course, is a journalist uh, and historian who has uh, written a lot of different biographies. Um, he must do a lot of reading or have a lot of assistance or something. <laughs> a lot of assistance or something. I, I don't know. I, well, I, I, I regret that I didn't go into academia, so I don't have graduate students. <laughs> I'm afraid if there's research, I have to do it myself, Chris. And it's, you know... It, it's freaking hard, is all I can say. Hard. Uh, all right. So that is th Liz Sales. Thank you so much. And then, um, well, let's get to another one here. Uh, Rob, Chris, if you can see this, and I'll make it bigger, you can talk us through this one. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, we've already uh, touched a bit about Shire. Again, he's, he's a hard to beat. And that's that copy there is the nice edition that I remember from when I was a kid. Uh, Grant, I haven't read, but um, I've heard very good things about it. And he is uh, probably the American historical figure next to Eisenhower and Marshall that I admire the most. So I actually do want to read that at some point. Um, I'm going to let you talk about Hamilton, since that seems to be your department. Uh, uh, Ron Tierno wrote a terrific book uh, that, that uh, somebody made a musical out of, I think. Uh, oh, so OK. Obscure musical. Uh, it's it's a very long book. If you want a shorter book, I can recommend one. Um, <laughs> I, don't, but, I don't read books about traders, though. But <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. That's all right. But <laughs> uh, but uh, he uh, uh, it's a very well written, well researched book. We've talked about um, uh, uh, Band of Brothers, and of course. Uh, 25 Yards of War, Ron Drez uh, worked with Stephen Ambrose, does tours with uh, Stephen Ambrose historical tours, and obviously is somebody who's very, very familiar to many of our uh, viewers here. And he, you know, he knew a lot of the vets, and I know um, his 25 Yards of War is based on a lot of his conversations uh, with the guys, so you know, good first-person stuff. Uh, and then, and, and now we're moving very fast now, because I'm sure we're, <laughs> I'm sure our our listeners, or our viewers are dropping like flies. But Murray Williams, we have uh, your selections here. Um, and let's see if we can just put that up full. Um, uh, um, Band of Brothers, again, Helmet for My Pillow. Do you know this one, Chris? Oh, absolutely. Robert Lucky. Um, the name's he, uh, Yep, he was uh, one of the characters in the Pacific series. And uh, 
a funny story about that. Um, Bruce McKenna, who was one of the writers on Band of Brothers, um, called me one day and said, hey, uh, they're going to make a, mo a movie series about the Pacific. Um, and we should, and we're trying to figure out what book to do it about. Um, and I said, well, Sledge with the old breed. And they said, well, that doesn't cover all the bases. So we're thinking about bringing in lots of other books, stories to tell. Uh, what other ones would you recommend? And Helmet for My Pillow is one of them. So that's why oh, okay. it appears as a character. Uh, again, just a really magnificent first person account of being a Marine in the Pacific. Uh, and then he wrote a great uh, history of the war in the Pacific from the Marines perspective called uh, strong men armed. So both are very, very good. Well, these are some excellent uh, suggestions from uh, Murray Williams. And um, we're going to just move on to look at uh, uh, Tom Bailing suggestions. Um, uh, David McCullough 1776 is about all the stuff. Well, I would have to say it's not all the stuff that happened in 1776 because he skipped a few things, I think, but yep. that's just me. Uh, Stephen uh, Sears, a very well-known uh, Civil War historian in his Gettysburg book. Magnificent. And, uh, At Dawn We Slept, another classic, uh, the, the Pearl Harbor book. And this is the book on the right that Yakir Katz was talking about earlier, The yep. Making of the Atomic Bomb. And then... Uh, the Last Stand by Nathaniel Philbrick, a book I have not read. So, uh, nor, nor have I. No. So I will. I, I have read other stuff by Nathaniel Philbrick that I've liked quite a bit. So, uh, but I have not read that one. And um, we did uh, Murray there, and we're getting close to our last. I think we have two more that we'll do. Um, and so we have Linda Griffith here, and put it up full. Uh, so the, the memoirs of U.S. Grant, uh, a, a fabulous book, Grant's uh, autobiography, and uh, which some people believe was written or the writing was assisted by Mark Twain. Don't think so, but it doesn't matter. It's just a, it, it is an excellent, it is, I can't think of a general's memoir that's better than that. Well, and I want to give a particular shout out to the Doughboys by Stallings. Uh, Stallings was uh, a doughboy uh, and absolutely magnificent book about the American experience during the First World War. And he was one of the first guys, first authors that pushed back against this notion uh, that the Americans came in right at the end and it was very easy. He, it, the book is magnificent. It talks about what the American contribution was to the end of the war and it was significant and it was important and it's a very, very good book. Excellent. And um, yeah, so we also have uh, Year of Decision, 1846, We Seven, which is the account of the uh, Mercury Seven astronauts and John Tolan's The Last 100 Days, which I feel like I should know, and yet I don't. Well, it's, yeah, any, anything by Tolan is worth reading. Fair enough. <laughs> well, well said, well said, Chris. And uh, Last, but by no means least, and we thank you all for staying uh, to, uh, to get this, but we have the uh, selections of Kim Nix uh, that she sent to us here. And um, I'm going to say, Chris, aside from With the Old Breed, which we've yeah. talked about, I have not read any of the other books on this list. Nor have I, but I know you, you, you like Eric Larson. So. I like Eric Larson, and I... Um, somebody's going to tell us what the Splendid and the Vile are about. Um, maybe it's the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, <laughs> I, I'm guessing that Victoria the Queen is about Victoria. Maybe. Just a thought. And um, But a nice selection of books there. And speaking of the Queen, you were saying that you... Um, you, you saw the Queen today. I did see the Queen tonight. As, you know, what are you doing? She's doing well. Her, her hair was as perfectly coiffed as ever. Uh, one of the things I thought was interesting, it, uh, they were saying here that it's only the fourth time uh, during her very long reign that she's had one of these public addresses. And you would have thought an event like that uh, would have had a lot of news coverage and hype. And in America, it certainly would have. Um, but here, um, they has normal programming. Uh, she came on at eight. She made a very uh, fitting and I thought appropriate speech. Took maybe five or ten minutes, 
and then they went back to regular programming. There was none of the the analysis, none of the pundits. It was just for speech. I thought it was uh, nice and, and interesting. Well, fabulous. Well, I um, think. Oh, no, go think ahead. Probably, no, I think it's probably time for us to wrap up. I mean, well, I, the, only I, other, the only other thing I was going to add, I want to obviously, yep, thank everybody for hanging in there a little bit long. We got actually some great ideas from people um, on the scroll. I got maybe some future ideas, and we need all the help we can get. Uh, we didn't get a chance. <laughs> we didn't get a chance to do um, our, our little visits through historic spots. So I want to give an extra shout out to Paul's WW2 TV. Um, if you can't travel to Normandy, check out his videos. He'll take you there. Uh, really great stuff, um, and you'll really get a lot out of it. And so just watch the videos. Imagine you're walking behind him, and you're back in Normandy. Yeah, just search that. it on YouTube. If you go to YouTube, yeah, you'll find him on YouTube search in you'll you'll find paul uh, on his channel so it was great that paul joined us it was great that uh yakir katz of stephen ambrose historical tours joined us uh and um you know and usually in tv shows this is where they say like you know wardrobe by uh uh yeah we don't even know yeah no i need makeup that's what i need i couldn't tell you where the wardrobe came from so but uh chris thank you so much great to see hey, you and, you uh, too Let's so we we're going to try next week to um, to uh, uh, have a, a interview with a special World War II veteran uh, and right. uh, do some other interesting stuff as well. So we hope you'll join us for what we hope will be a slightly shorter edition of History Happy Hour. So thank you so much. Stay safe, everybody. All right, and we are just talking over the credits now. Here it is. Uh, but we'll thank everybody and say uh, say good night, Chris. Good night, Chris.